Today is January 22nd, 2018, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 74. Today, about AI that can predict when you are going to die. We're going to be taking a look at how health data can help with murder trials. Also, taking a glimpse into Apple's latest design changes and much, much more. Call in those life saving drones, because Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hi guys, welcome back. It's another episode of Human Factors Cast. Blake Arnstorff's over there. How are you doing, Blake? Oh, I'm killing it, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm your host, Nick Rome. <laughs> We're squishing things up today. I don't know what's gotten into me. We're <laughs> <laughs> we're just we're just doing we're going off the rails already. It's what we're we're thirty seconds in, and uh, it's already going off the rails. Blake, well, I, it's been it's been a week, man. How have you been? Oh man, I've been I've been so good, trying new things, doing a bunch of new stuff. But if I don't know if anybody remembers from last week, Nick, maybe you do. I told you that I had gotten an Apple Watch, but I hadn't opened the box yet. So finally, opened the box up, and I've got to tell you that Apple maybe in fact losing its touch with design what but i have to say that getting the apple watch set up they definitely nailed that set of processes it was the easiest thing to do to get it synced up with my phone get get data running to some of the apps and all that kind of stuff okay but hang on back up you said apple may be losing its touch with design now what makes Ye- you say that yeah so there were some major problems with even even like starting with just setup right so I don't really run Bluetooth all the time on my phone, even though Apple wants you to have it on like constantly. Like if you restart your phone, if you get a new update, it Bluetooth will automatically be on. Sure. Well, so to pair an Apple Watch, you have to turn Bluetooth on, which that's kind of a natural thing. Yeah, you would usually think of it. But when you turn the Apple Watch on, all it says is put it next to your iPhone. Now, okay. all I did, and I sat there for like five straight minutes wondering what is going on here why will it not pair so bluetooth was the ultimate problem it wasn't anything like nfc or or something no no i mean it just ended up i all i had to do was turn the bluetooth on but the instructions from the iphone or the iphone or the apple watch itself neither one said like here's the problem just turn your bluetooth on uh so it was one of those things where i had to fool around with it and poke around and i just feel like i felt like that through for a lot of my like Apple products recently, especially when they're making changes to the phone. Um, but don't get me wrong, I love the Apple Watch as a fitness tracker and some of the little notifications and feeling like I can always, you know, be on top of email and text messages and all that stuff, especially doing freelance right now. So it's it's kind of nice in that regard. But it I don't know, it's very interesting hearing all these people talk about kind of like Apple's design, how it's kind of going straying from the path of being user centered. And sometimes I wonder if that isn't true, if they're really focusing on some of the maybe more prettier aspects versus some of the functionality, uh, which we talk a little bit. We'll, we'll, we will get a chance to talk about a little bit later in the show. Nice little tease. I like that. Yeah. But Nick, what's been going on with you, man, man? Well, I was about to say we had the most amazing weekend, but we didn't, uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> we overhyped an event that uh, actually wasn't even, it, it, it didn't happen. So, the, uh, but, to, but to fill our listeners in, uh, Blake and I had plans to see uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi in 4D, which is uh, basically like a two and a half hour Star Tours ride where, you know, the seats are moving up and down, left and right. And, and uh, you know, there's water effects and fire effects and smoke and and uh, heat and everything, and and uh, it it just didn't work out because uh, it it was the weekend after it had finished its run in the 4D theaters, which is unfortunate because I really wanted to come back and report on this experience, and of course I'm super bummed because it was going to be a birthday event for me, but uh, it's okay because I I got something else in the pipeline this week. Um, on Wednesday I'm going to. Uh, there is the Secrets of the Empire hyper reality experience. I think I teased it on the show a couple months back, but I am I am finally going to this thing on on Wednesday of this week. Um, so if you happen to be in downtown Disney and you're a listener, say hi. I, I will be I will be doing this thing, and uh, it, it's a hyper reality experience. So what that means is they basically toss this headset on you, and you're walking around this 
virtual environment, which is also mapped to the physical environment that you are in, and you can interact with elements like switches and buttons and and objects in the physical world, and all those things are mapped to the virtual environment. So everything that you move, everything you manipulate is also, um, you see it, but through the lens of a Star Wars uh, aesthetic, if you will. Uh, so I'm excited for that, so we'll see how that goes. That sounds like it's going to be super fun. And just as a side note, Nick, have you ever seen a 4D movie? I have not. Have you? No, I haven't. And, you know, I thought about it the other day that maybe we should just, next time there's one out that we think is even worth it, we should try it. Because I would love to, one, do it, but also I would, like, talk about it on the show as, like, a joint experience. Oh, yeah. I would. I completely agree. Let's, I, I was, I think we should make it happen for Solo, at least for sure. Ooh, that's a that's a really good idea. I like it. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see we'll see if there's anything else that catches our eye before then. But yeah, I I completely agree. I'm, I'm really bummed that we didn't get to do it. And uh, you know, we'll 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 just have to uh, get on it quicker and uh, next time. You know, it, I, I I'm I'm upset. Can you tell, Blake? <laughs> I'm so yes, sad. I can tell. <laughs> what but I hope you season? had a good birthday anyway. Uh, it's it hasn't happened yet, so we will see. But um, I hope that it's going to be a good one. <laughs> I hope so too. We will see. Uh, okay, I want to get into um, so this week on uh, the Slack community, we uh, one of our listeners said uh, glad glad we talked about the Hawaiian missile alert. That was uh, Brian and. Uh, compliments on us on our A plus for interesting news. So thank you for that, Brian. But also, more importantly, I, I wanted to bring up the fact that when when we do bring up these things in Slack, uh, sometimes we'll um, occasionally post follow up articles to these things. So actually, in the Slack, you can take a look at the UI for the Hawaii missile uh, crisis false alarm. Um, you can you can take a look at that UI. There's an article that covers that, and I believe uh, there's another article that I posted up there. But it's the amplifying information that you won't find here on the show or in our news feeds. You only get that stuff in the Slack. So uh, have fun over there. But uh, Actually, Nick, since you threw that little tidbit in there, I was going to talk a little bit about two kind of heavy hitters in the you know design and UX world and you know psychology world that wrote follow-up. Uh, kind of just articles for like Design Co. and on Medium about this. But instead, I'll throw those in the Slack as well. And it's kind of like a breakdown of, obviously, this was human error, but what, but what caused the human error and kind of like speculation about design and all that kind of stuff. So it's a pretty cool take. So check that in the Slack. Oh, yeah. The other, sorry, just to interject here, the other article that we shared was a, um, there was a Japanese broadcaster that did basically the same thing Um you know, almost, almost what a couple of days afterwards. So it's like it. It was really relevant that this all happened around the same time when it rains and pours. I guess, right? Yeah, I guess so. Just kind of like a bad timing of things in general. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. All right. Well, why don't you say we get into the news of things? Uh, this is the part of the show all about human factors news. This is where we break down everything from psychology, human factors, design, VR, whatever it is. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is up for discussion. So, Blake, what do we got up first this week? Uh, first this week, Nick, man, we got some heavy AI stories, and this could be really cool. Yeah, we do. So, for the first time ever, we have two AI systems built to process and respond to human speech, a.k.a. chatbots, and they actually outscored humans in a reading comprehension test designed by Stanford researchers. The Stanford Question Answering Dataset, a.k.a. Squad, is composed of a staggering 100,000 questions following brief reading passages. After reading excerpts from Wikipedia, the system answers questions like, what is the Latin name for the Black Death, and how many actors have played Doctor Who. Both Microsoft and Alibaba also developed a AI that outscored humanity in the latest round of testing. Alibaba's AI score was around an 82.44, and Microsoft's was 82.65, with humans trailing behind both, both of them at 82.30. Now, that's a... I probably need to dig back in the article, but that doesn't seem like a huge difference, but obviously it's meaningful for them to report about it. Is Wouldn't that make sense, Nick? Yeah, I think we're just looking at the raw numbers here. Oh, look, they beat it. Uh, you know, not by much, but they did. So there is that. <laughs> I, I mean, it's both exciting and worrying to see that computer systems are advancing this much. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, there goes our friendly car alarm for the week. Uh, oh, oh. And there I goes it's got, there goes our friendly technical difficulty for the week. All right, go ahead. Oh, bummer. <laughs> it, I guess it is kind of alarming, but is it is it really? So, I mean, what I how I kind of envision this, and again, this could be too much science fiction, but if stuff's able to you know outscore how quickly we can read, which is I'm assuming read or answer questions. I mean, what if that AI was feeding into your own intelligence? Does that make any sense? Like if we if we really get into this place where we're putting chips in our brains and BCIs are a, a real thing, what if we're learning in this kind of modular way through just AI blocks that are able to give us information or help us answer questions? So that's kind of cool possibility. Uh, but what scares you about it, Nick? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm necessarily scared by it as much as surprised by it. I, I think, you know, I, I don't even know if I can say I'm surprised by it anymore because we're, we're seeing sort of these leaps and bounds in artificial intelligence over the last couple of years, especially where, you know, something <clears throat> something that is news today uh, that would have surprised us yesterday is just kind of like, oh, yeah, that's the next step. And I'm kind of right there with this is that, you know, this. is Oh, yeah, that's the next step. I don't there's not. You know what I mean? It, it's I can't. I don't know. I, I'm surprised, but I feel like I shouldn't be surprised because this is just it. it it's just, the train is just going at this point. Yeah, sure. And I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. This is just the next step because we I've talked about it before. Like if you if you are coming from the school of thought, I mean, he kind of like Ray Kurzweil's writings or, or whatnot. I mean, a lot of what he talks about is just the exponential factors of how technology grows. And so now that we're seeing AI starting to beat us, even though I, I made the the comment that it was by a very small margin, I mean, we're talking like, I don't know, a couple tenths uh, of a percent or tenths of a time here. But now that we've seen it finally happen, it is far enough ahead of humans to be to be you know or at least on par with at least on yeah. par with yeah yeah at least on par with i mean we're gonna see that just jump really high likely it's not gonna stay in this tiny gap like likely now we'll hear more and more things of like how it's just we can't even really compete with the ai which does get a little a little bit a little bit nerve-wracking in terms of you know what does that mean for job security for things like maybe even customer service, the processing information and answering customer questions. I mean, this is talking about chatbots outscoring humans. And as we, I don't know if you've noticed, Nick, I definitely have, but a lot of websites, especially that are like uh, software as a service websites, they all employ chatbots that are yeah. trying to talk to you immediately and answer your questions. Um, so I, it's, I, I do feel like you're right. It kind of is the the status quo. Like you spe- expect these things to jump and, transform um but i don't really know what to make of this except for what's going to come next well i okay so let's think about the application of this right so this is in the context of chatbots right and you said it yourself software as a service uses these chatbots a lot so if they can downsize on sort of the human component of of actually having customer service right so the fact that they could these these automated systems this this artificial intelligence can effectively read as good as another human can they can they can answer sort of these these generic questions it's almost like an interactive frequently asked questions if you will because they can look at these the the the, when i say them i I mean the ai systems they can look at these questions that are fielded by uh users of the software or whatever it is that they're using and then they they provide answers that don't require that much depth Right. And anything that they can't answer, they forward to a human operator and then they they can, uh, you know, it's kind of like a filter for that human operator. So they don't have so much of a workload where they're responding to a bunch of tiny questions here and there, but rather um, the deeper ones that require actual human thought to them. Um, That's that's kind of where I'm looking at this, at least at least where the scores are now. Um, Like, you know, they even say in the article, this is this can tell you. you know facts about John F Kennedy but it can't tell you it the system doesn't know who John F, uh, John F Kennedy is right so it can't establish that sort of importance behind um political historical figures it can't sort of uh get that context that humans have but it could tell you how many actors played Doctor Who it's to me it's kind of like a quick google search and um if they could apply these in a chatbot setting that makes sense to me where it's it's almost like that that 
pre-routing before it goes to the human operator. Yeah, and I mean, you, you make a good point about John F. Kennedy, and it, it does talk about in the article how far AI is actually from comprehending anything um, as far as how we understand concepts and, I guess, problem solve. So it, it does make a lot more sense, the utility of it, though, especially like in these chatbot services. Um, my, my kind of interest from here is now that we've got this system that's able to like take in data and understand kind of like, okay, I can answer this question because I've seen the information before. How do we make that next leap forward to where it can kind of problem solve and reason and maybe even be not not just like a secondary aid that can answer one-off questions for a human operator, but also kind of work with them in between to maybe problem solve before it starts like completely doing it by itself. Right, and when when will we have the AI that we can become friends with and potentially have a third host on the show, which maybe next week, right? That's a small yep. tease. Hey, look at that. <laughs> it's coming. Off the rails. Okay. All right. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one, or should we move into the other AI story of the week? Let's go to the other one. It's kind of All crazy. Right. All right. Yeah, it is. Okay. So more AI. So using an artificially intelligent algorithm to predict patient mortality, a research team from Stanford University is hoping to improve the timing of end-of-life care for critically ill patients. In tests, the system proved eerily accurate, correctly predicting mortality outcomes in 90% of cases. And the death-predicting algorithm is not meant to replace doctors, but offer a tool to improve ac accuracy and prognosis. In addition to improving the timing of pall pallia palliative care... Nailed it. The system, <laughs> the system could also ease the burden placed on doctors when trying to predict patient outcomes, which is a laborious, laborious and time-consuming process. So the good news is, is that the system can only get better at predicting when we might die. As unsettling it is, as it is, the results uh, end in better end-of-life care, and that's a good thing overall. Now, Nick, we kind of hit a little bit on something like this last week, but it wasn't so much just predicting when somebody would die. It was using kind of AI and data to understand, like, uh, based off kind of vital signs, if somebody's going to be in the line for cardiac arrest within the next few hours or something like that. And this is kind of a different take on it. But again, we're seeing yeah. just more more of the importance of these algorithms in uh, the healthcare system. Man, this goes back to what I was saying in the last article. I'm surprised, but I feel like I shouldn't be because this is just the next evolution of that article that we talked about last week with the cardiac arrest. Now we're predicting death, and it happens so rapidly, so fast. I think these articles almost came out at the same time. So it's just it's surprising to me that the these algorithms can see something that we cannot. Um, and... You know, they, they can't tell exactly what's wrong, obviously, but they can they are picking up on cues that are accurately diagnosing and predicting mortality in 90 percent of cases. That is insane to me. Yeah, I mean, that that's a ridiculously high high rate of success for an algorithm that's lo just basically just doing really high power trend analysis and then in like being able to interject and say like hey this this person needs help or here's what you this is somebody you should tackle like giving them better uh, end of life care now versus later and it's it's interesting to me like how dead accurate this is and this is like a form of that the deep learning and neural networks that we're t when we talk about ai and it just it it surprises me that this hasn't been abstracted in a whole bunch of places because now we've seen it basically saving human lives or extending or making quality of life better. And I just feel like that's only going to pro proliferate more as time goes on with these types of things. Yeah, you know, I think the thing that's most surprising to me is that the signs are there, but the doctors can't pick up on them, obviously, because we have, we're having this problem. But the computer can. And it's looking through all this raw data, and it's finding these trends. And the next step is to say, okay, well, what are these trends? And how do we sort of, um, you know, act on them to to help save lives? <laughs> this is I this is my favorite story of the week, man. I got to say, this is this blew me away when I saw it. The other one, uh, I believe, the the last week's story that we with the cardiac arrest. I think that one was FDA approved, right? Yeah, that was the first uh, FDA-approved algorithm for that kind of use. I can't imagine something like this would have a hard time with that large of a success uh, rate, you know, to to be passed. 
through the FDA. So maybe this one will be one of the next ones we see. I hope so, because really the more we see this being approved by the FDA and regulators in general, I mean, across the globe, the better chance we have for this not just to be giving you the best care at the end of your life, but potentially, okay, we, we see the end of life is coming. Is there any way to extend it? Does the patient want to extend it? Is there, a, is there procedures we can start to develop and spend more time on or research we can do that's more focused on, you know, longevity versus treating diseases at the end of life. So it, it kind of opens a lot of new doors as far as the development of AI and deep learning, but also even in medical practice, like being able to shift your focus um, to, you know, more high power tech in the OR. Yeah, I completely agree. This has applications beyond just the patient, uh, though. I mean, this has applications for early warning systems for family members. If the AI predicts, you know, that, that somebody's end of life is coming soon, they can blast out a message to them so they can be there in their final moments. Like, there's just... There's there's a lot that could be done for this if you know I'm I just I I I'm speechless dude I can't this is too much this is awesome Yeah it's like it's somewhere between like being really really just mind blowing and I just want to see it all over the place cuz be like you like you're talking about being able to give families that like closure in your mind like this is all the time you have left uh, so it's 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 a good time to be here or provide better care than somebody would receive otherwise based off of just an algorithm that's able to process a lot of data and give you meaningful information. It's it's awesome. The, the one thing I do worry about, and this is only speculation, right, is how all of this is communicated to people. Um, yeah. So medical professionals, that kind of stuff. And I, th- I think that's a, a great realm that we people in our field will have opportunities to really work with AI and the design of those kind of information systems. Cause I'm sure even the technology will change. It won't just be UIs. It could be, you know, BCIs in the operating room or something like that. But yeah. it's, it's a cool, cool time for human factors people. Yeah. And I feel like we covered a story on that about um, how like last year sometime about how they were using like AI to explain things to patients does that does that ring a bell to you yeah so we i know we went through a bunch of them right like we we talked a lot about vr in the operating room for children the, especially them going those going through cancer treatments i remember that one yeah no, um, it was it yeah, was i don't directly man, we've had so many it. medical stories in the last year it's kind of insane i know yeah it, it really is maybe maybe i can find it while you're reading the next story but oh wait never mind i Never mind. That's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I can you imagine what would happen, though, if they applied this data set to other thing or this um, the, these learning models, right, where you have sort of, um, you know, you can predict weather. It, it, you know, our weather predictions are getting more and more accurate, but um, I'd be curious to see what happens when you run it through a deep learning algorithm. And maybe one of our listeners knows a little bit more about this, but, uh, uh, yeah, I'd be, cu- I'd be curious to see what other kind of data they can, they can pull these types of trends where there is, there are obvious signs that we're not picking up on, um, that sort of can derive conclusions that we can't see. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there is a massive potential for this in, um, in military. Oh uh, yeah. As far as, I, I don't know. I'm sure there is some insane DARPA stuff going on. that's related to AI, but I, I can just imagine the being able to really take in all this data that's collected and synthesize either action plans or threat levels and really give you a more meaningful look. I just, I feel like this gets, this is, that's a really great application for this just because there's so many disparate pieces of data I know that are collected as far as like uh, military intelligence. And then what do you do with it? It's, it's all sorts of crazy stuff. And I don't, I don't know. I, when I think of these really deep learning algorithms and basically decision support tools, I automatically think like how these things are going to try going to impact military use. Cause I mean, you want to see as much information as collected being informing like soldiers and all that kind of stuff. So we can, again, use basically use data and data processing to save more lives. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
yeah, I can't wait to see what other things come out of this. Uh, but I think we've talked this one to death. You want to move on to the next one? Let's go to the next one. This one, this one really blew my mind, Nick. I, I'm still not sure how, how I feel about it. But anyway, so in a German murder trial, health data from the accused accused iPhone is being used by the prosecution as proof of murder. Investigators use the iPhone's health app, which comes pre-installed on iOS 8 and later, re- which records data like how many steps you took, you take, and guesses at what kind of activity you might have been doing throughout the day. The accused data showed peaks of stren- strenuous activity that supported the investigator's theory of how the victim was murdered and where the body was actually taken and dropped off. Further, geolocation data was also used to help confirm the location of the location of the accused at the time of the murder and also time of death. So even though health data has helped us in so many ways for saving lives, knowing how many steps you take turns out that it can be pre-revealing information when it comes to a murder trial. Nick, we've talked multiple times now about data collection, how it can be used to save people. We've talked before about how Alexa was used in different <laughs> different kind of murder trial situations or criminal trials, but I would have never have thought about, and this is kind of biting me, that you could use the iPhone's kind of health app for steps and location to really pinpoint people's movement. See, I've thought about location before, right? The first thing any any smart murderer should do, and I know this because I listen to all the all my partner's true crime broad podcast with her, not because I'm a murderer, but <laughs> just, just to be clear. Right. So, <laughs> so just to be really clear. So the first thing a good murderer should do is remove all electronics from them because that leaves a digital footprint. And, uh, you carry in your pocket, a device that records your every word. And so that's why I'm not afraid to say a good murderer would remove the phone because obviously my phone listens to everything I say, so it it would know if I really was a murderer or not. And now that I'm drawing so much attention to it, now I'm starting to make our listeners wonder, and uh, this just turned into a true crime podcast. So there's that. But <laughs> also, more importantly, I think that, yes, we are carrying these devices that collect so much data on them. It only makes sense to use them in these contexts where you have sort of all, the, all these mysterious elements um, that may get more clarity once you have that, that data right and i think it's so smart of them to look at this and to say oh look they stopped making steps here oh look their heart rate was going down here and like just those kinds of things it's it's pretty astounding to me yeah i mean it's pretty astounding i mean i took out some of the more grisly details from the the murder about the murder in the article but i mean being able to pinpoint that based on kind of your heart rate the steps you were taking, this the, your your activity was actually hard and not normal for what you've been doing throughout the day. Is kind of a, kind of an incredible leap between the two. The one thing that I did notice in the article, and it's it's kind of tough to talk about when it's on this kind of flip side of the coin because this guy turns turns out to be guilty or at least he admits to committing the crime. But part yeah. of this was that they did have to take his phone and he refused to give his password up. Um, so they had to hack his phone to get it open. And it's it's one of those things that if you like like we're kind of talking about, if you're not really thinking about the fact that you have a phone at, on you at all times, they can track your steps and really be used to kind of abstract and know what you're doing at different times during the day. How could that be used against you? And, and in this case, it's for a great cause. Somebody was was murdered and I mean, of course, somebody needs to be brought to justice here, but I, I think it brings in some some data privacy issues and a little bit of ethical issues that we have to, you know, think about in the future. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Uh, yeah, uh, but I mean, like, the thing that surprised me, too, was kind of this footnote on here that this wasn't the first time this kind of activity was being used in court, right? So, um in 2014, Fitbit history used to prove a client's personal injury claim. Um, and then uh, the next year, so 2015, uh, more Fitbit data was used to undermine a uh, another claim. We'll, we'll keep the details just, you know, on the on the you can read the article if you're if you would like to. But we're going to keep the details kind of uh, high level here just so that way we don't unintentionally 
uh, spark anybody. <laughs> Just so you're aware. That's why we're skirting around this. And then um, last February, a man's pacemaker put him in prison for arson. So uh, it's crazy to see that, you know, these these kinds of things are already being used. And uh, now now Apple's joining the gang. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's cool and it's scary at the same time because it's it's funny how just basically your steps and your heart rate can be used plus your geolocation to know what you've done throughout the day and that kind of freaks me out right because now i'm i'm one walking around with an iphone in my pocket most of the time but also like an apple watch on my wrist at all times so it's it's, it's, it's as if you could you could know what i'm doing in some fashion or if somebody really wanted to know be able to figure out what i was doing at all times during the day or at least have an idea so so blake uh, are you a murderer is that what i'm understanding here uh, no okay. what what you're understanding is that i am <laughs> always paranoid about people hacking these devices and kind of using it nefariously um but in this case it was used well so, I mean, I, I can't really argue with any of, like, the ethics in this specific trial. All right. Then that's fair enough. Uh, really quick note, though. I, w- I would like to say that if you go to uh, Google.com slash map slash timeline, you can see all the data that you they have on you. And it's really fun to look uh, back to see, you know, what what it, what it looks like. So Where you've been. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they, they know all this stuff. They know all this stuff. They can see where you hid that body. All right. Well, anyway, I just want to take a minute here to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, TechCrunch, Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can join us in our Slack, and the link is in the show description, or you can follow us all over social media. We post those articles as we find them. In addition to thanking our friends over at Engadget, TechCrunch, and Gizmodo, I would like to thank you guys, our listeners. You know, we couldn't do this show without you, and it always means so much to us when you bring us along on your commute and just put us in your ear when you're walking along and doing your stuff around the house. It really means a lot to us uh, because we are just talking to each other, but really we're talking to you too. So thank you for listening and uh, thank you for coming on this journey with us. And I, I rarely thank you guys except for at the end of the show. I just wanted to throw a little thank you in the middle of the show. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right. So this is a little bit of a fun one. So last week, Apple updated the look of its web-based app store, and definitely has this, has the feel of iOS 11 app store, which Apple completely redesigned and launched last September. However, unlike the iOS 11, there is no focus on app discovery. The functionality is all about the same as the original design, but what, what it comes down to is the design is cleaner and it feels simpler, maybe because of the increased amount of white space. And there's also a bit more emphasis on customer reviews. So Nick, you had put this in Slack and said something like, hey, maybe maybe you can help us out with this because I use the iPhone, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I went to you know open up the App Store because it is a a program just on my laptop preloaded. And I didn't even realize that Apple has a web-based app store. That's not what's located on your, uh, mach- your local machine. Oh, no. um, so I had actually not seen this and <laughs> I don't know if I'll be that much more help than you would. Cause I don't have any experience with it, but I threw both of them in our show notes and I figured we could talk a little bit about them. Um, yeah, I saw that. Uh, you know, I just thought of something else too. I'm wondering if this has changed for podcasts as well, because those are in the app store. Are they not? Um, I get mine from a podcast app. Oh, okay. Like well, th- that's, that's built by Apple it, and it looks the same. Okay. Well, yeah, it's very much the same. All right. Well, I'm wondering if it, it's going to hinder our discoverability. Um, I don't think it necessarily will, uh, especially since we're getting out to like you know multiple platforms outside of just Apple. Oh sure, I mean iTunes is huge though. Anyway, that's that's behind the scenes stuff. We don't need to talk about that in front of our in front of our listeners. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> but anyway, so the the two designs we have just for for your essay, Nick. On the left, we have the OG design, the original, and on the right, we've got this what the little blurb is talking about: a lot more white space, brand new look. Um. Overall, I'm just going to hop in here because overall, I am I understand that it looks a lot cleaner and simpler, but I don't really know 
why why they made such that made the change without really any, improving any of the functionality. Um, yeah. In fact, it looks like from the sidebar they took away a lot of stuff, and I don't know where they where they might have put it. This is again based on very small screenshots. Yeah, so I'm looking at this, and uh, one of the one of the things that the article highlights is that they took away the App Store's discoverability, and um, you know, over here on the left hand side, what they used to have is basically all the stuff that you would sort of associate with like an ESRB rating, you know, uh, like infrequent mild cartoon or fantasy violence or, you know, all that stuff. And it gives you details about the pricing and all that. stuff. So the, there's not really all that much extra there. Um, but what they did do was they kind of moved the ratings and um, at least the ratings, they moved to the top and then the description, they moved to the bottom. Right. So I, I think it looks tighter and cleaner uh, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure. Like this is, this is why I posed it to you because I, I am not an app store user. I, I don't know, um, whether or not this is a needed change or whether or not this was just kind of unnecessary. Well, and yeah, I mean, I think even just looking at it though, Nick, I mean, you see the top in, in this case, it's, a it's for tech. We got the article from TechCrunch. So imagine looking at basically an iPhone icon for the TechCrunch app and it's got like a small, rating system on this like little just star rating next to it but it doesn't tell you anything about what the app is unless you visually scan down below the imagery for the app and look at the actual description and I, I don't know about most iPhone users or not but I found those descriptions for what the app actually did especially when it's kind of in a list not necessarily when you'd be in this page view but more in a list view that gives me a better idea if it does what I needed to do so now they've kind of they've they have made it look clean, but now they've kind of removed some of the utility and put it at a different place. That, I mean, it's it's not like you can't find it, but it just I don't think the change makes a whole lot of sense because um, no. they they did remove a lot of the sidebar, which opens up a, a bunch of space um, to to move everything and let everything be a little more spaced out. But now they've kind of created this weird um, kind of visual hierarchy with just the app then the app uh, symbol being huge with everything else being kind of small and then focusing on screenshots, which is not a bad, bad thing. Cause that's sometimes what I would, you know, be drawn to to try and see like what the app looks like, get a sense of how you would navigate it, any kind of usability things. Um, but still, but still, I, I don't see how this enhances, you know, you, the functionality of it at all, which I know it says it doesn't, but why did they make such a drastic change uh, just for the sake of design? You know what? I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this doesn't even look all that different to me. And I, uh, the only thing that really is bad about this design is the fact that the description is a little bit hidden. Um, other than that, I, I don't I don't see what all this criticism is about. Yeah, I just don't understand why they're why the logo is so huge and it doesn't tell you a thing about what the app is you're trying to get into. Okay, fair point. I think this is kind of a non-story, honestly, but you know, it's fun to it's fun to kind of take a look at what some of these big tech companies are doing in terms of uh, organizing their information, because oftentimes a lot of a lot of other companies will follow suit and use uh, these other bigger companies as templates. So that's why we kind of deep dive into these sometimes, even though it may seem mundane or simple. Uh, with just a simple redesign, it's always it's always interesting to see what these companies are doing just to kind of to keep us up to date on on what sort of these web design standards are. Yeah, back to the drawing board for Apple, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we get into the last story of the week? A feel good story. Oh, God. Yeah, this is insane. All right. So New South Wales spent about three hundred and forty thousand dollars in investments in drones and has apparently paid off in a major way. So last week, two teenage boys in Australia who were struggling in rough waters offshore were saved thanks to a rescue drone. So it took all of 70 seconds for the Little Ripper UAV to make its way to the boys and then drop an inflatable pod to rescue them. The, gov the government of South Wales' investment in a fleet of drones was originally part of a $13 million shark management strategy program that turns out that it can actually save human lives as well 
So I, I had heard of kind of EMT style drones. I think we'd even talked about that on the podcast before. Oh, yeah. But I but I hadn't heard of kind of these in the water rescue drones. And this is a really awesome case for why why more countries should have them. Because, I mean, especially here in California, a lot of people like to enjoy, you know, either surfing or being out in the water at all times during the year. So this sounds like a, a worthy investment. I agree. And I think think about how much money you're saving on uh, personnel costs when when you're exposing lifeguards uh, to dangerous situations and like rip currents or whatnot where they can't actually get out there and save somebody um, or you know in these situations where um, people could potentially just stay afloat until help arrives via boat or whatever because they're too far out um, this this to me is like the quick fix. Like it said, 70 seconds out drops the thing. Okay, well, at least now we have something to hold on to. We're not going to drown out here while we wait for somebody to get us. Like that that has to be, from from the perspective of the people drowning, uh, that's got to be a sign of relief. <laughs> also, too, I mean, uh, the difference between a few seconds or minutes could mean you you dying in the water yeah. or drowning or anything like that. So even though it's, it's only, you know, kind of putting a damper on the situation. And in this case, I mean, matters could have been worse, right? Cause it sounds like this was, a, these drones were originally set up for shark management. Um, so there, there's a lot of odd variables you can go on, especially when you're in rough waters. Um, but the 70 seconds to, to launch the drone, get it out to other people and have it basically provide them s- relative safety for the moment is kind of incredible. And the, I think the article also mentions too, that it was a lifeguard that deploys it. So I wonder if that means that they've actually, um, you know, incorporated kind of UAV stations inside of some of these lifeguard huts that they have. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. I, I'd imagine they'd see it from shore and then they deploy it from there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's kind of like a new arsenal, right? Because I don't know. I'm used to being out here in California, where you basically you see the white jeeps driving around, and they've got like two giant surfboards on them, which are meant for yeah. life rescue if they see somebody having a hard time in the water or something like that far out. But now it could be in addition to that, they've got two drones sitting in the front seat that they just drop out of the car and send them off. Yeah, it's definitely streamlining the process for sure and saving lives on all ends of the spectrum, right? Both both uh, the people who are in trouble and the people who are saving those people in trouble. Uh, it's, it's basically streamlining everything, and I love it. I'm on the Little Ripper Facebook page right now um, that's, that's kind of talking about uh, the, the event in South Wales, and there's, a, there's an article that goes into sort of the technology behind uh, this drone that saved these two people's lives. So... Um, worth a, worth a read for sure. If you're interested. Um, yeah, I, I, I love, I love this story. This is, this is a feel good story. Good way to end the week. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before we get into some Reddit posts? All I got is I love that this week's kind of theme, like originally I looked at it as being AI heavy, but really it's how technology is saving lives in different forms. This is really cool. That's a good take, Blake. I like that. Awesome stuff. You ready for Reddit time? I am. Let's switch gears and get to the It Came From Reddit section. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you guys the topics the community is talking about. So any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion amongst you guys, the community. So, Blake, uh, looks like we got time for about two. What do you want to go with? One, Uh two, or three? So I definitely want to do three, okay? Because uh, that that's like one of the first human factors related ones I've seen. Okay. Um. Uh. I don't know. I'll let you pick this. Pick the second one. Okay. Let's do. Uh, I feel like I've talked one to death, but I want to talk about it more. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's kind of a good week for it. It's all over the like UX newsletters and all that kind of stuff. So oh, is fun. it? I, I'm not. I'm not hooked into the UX newsletters. Yeah, yeah. Like when I'm populating social media every Sunday, it's just uh, it kind of come. There's basically big themes for the week, and dark UX is a big one this week. Sure. So, uh, oh, I don't have the Reddit post here, but it was on. Oh wait, there it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it. So it was on uh, UX Design. Dot CC, and uh, this was posted by Specs, but it's an article too. Um, 
uh, from the UX Collective. It's uh, let's see an article by Kelsey Bones. When does good user experience become evil? And and this presumably I didn't I didn't read this article because it was a Reddit post. I thought it was just a question, but uh, it talks about several different facets like recipro- reciprocation, wah, reciprocation, commitment and consistency, uh, social proof, liking, authority, search, uh, search s- scarcity. Wow. It's hard to read tonight, <laughs> but uh, these are all topics covered in. Um, I like to plug this book a lot. He doesn't pay me. I would love it if he paid me, but he doesn't pay me. It's just a book that I feel is a good sort of entry book uh, to sort of uh, understanding how sort of these dark patterns of UX are established. And it's uh, Evil by Design by Chris Nodder. Now, this book goes into kind of separates it by the seven deadly spin- sins and um gives examples of how these sins could be used in design to sort of hook you in a way that's not going to uh, benefit you, but rather benefit the company. It's really interesting. Um, And there's a a lot of talk. I don't know. I'm going to kind of use this as freeform, Blake, if that's okay. Do it, man. All right. I'm going to use this time to talk about predatory gaming um, uh, and and gambling behavior. So like, there's this whole concept of loot boxes, and we kind of talked this about this on the show when the Battlefront controversy came out. But you know, I I was thinking about this a lot more, and the way UX can get really dark really quick is if they have sort of these established profiles of gamers, and and whether or not uh, someone is likely to purchase one of these in-game items, right? And the idea behind them is that there's randomized chance that you'll get an item that you need. And one way that they could do this is sort of build these sort of persona profiles of these people. And the people who are more likely to buy something if they get something good, right? So you start everybody off with with odds that are in their favor and then slowly ramp that back behind the scenes to where they're paying more and more money to get something that, you know, that that they need. Uh, I I feel like something like that could be really predatory and it's a real concern right now, especially in the gaming community where you have sort of all of these games with these in game loot box systems where you have to pay real world money to get to them. And they all have this randomization element. Um, I don't know. Uh, What's your take on all that, Blake? So I'm going to take a, a kind of completely different route because I, I did read Kelsey's article earlier today and it's it's a really good read. I encourage you guys to go search it out. I mean, it, it's literally called When Does User Experience Become Evil? Um, and she, she breaks down a lot about like the principles of persuasion and psychology and how that can play into either good, good design for good meaning, good for users providing value, bad kind of meaning just either producing hooking behaviors kind of what nick is talking about a little bit with the loot boxes or even just not providing them true value Uh, but some kind of theme that i've noticed basically for the past couple of days between this dark ux but also the role of designers and how it's changed and how that's resulting in a change of work so when i when i saw the question when does good user experience become evil i I think it's important to talk about this kind of shift in where designers are sitting in companies now. Because, I mean, a lot of the big companies in Silicon Valley, they now truly recognize the value and power of great design in their products. Whether that's user experience designers, that's incorporating human factors researchers into their product development, what have you. There, there's obviously been a big ROI in having those people in the company, and you don't have to fight as much to get your voice heard. But what that's also resulted in is you having a bigger seat at the table. And now you have to play this balancing game between what is best for my user, which which people like myself and Nick have been dealing with, which is trying to convince stakeholders like, hey, these design changes that you want to make or some of these behaviors you want to put in, it's not going to ultimately pro- provide the best value uh, to your customer or to your user base. But the thing about companies is is they need to and are driven on a lot of times making money. So now you're balancing this act between am I meeting users' needs, but am I also meeting the business the business's needs itself? And I I read a few interesting articles kind of surrounding um, you know, 
dark patterns in UX. And as designers get this more C-suite level in the company, they stop being so concerned with really what the user needs are and fighting that kind of good fight versus instead focusing more on is this making the business money? Uh, is it pushing the product forward in the way that the company wants it to go? And you kind of then start seeing the sacrifice of usability, even with higher end designers at the top of the food chain. So I think like when we're talking about when does it become evil, I think it's when we stop making sure that we're bal- it, at the very least balancing user needs and what companies can do for their users with it, with turning a profit to keep the doors open um, and pay your employees. But I think there is a shift. And if we really pay attention to some of the bigger companies products, I think we see like a degradation in some of the design choices leading away from, uh, functionality to just aesthetic and things like that. So I don't know. It's kind of an odd take on this particular subject, but I figured I'd go wild west for the day. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. It's, it's a nice, uh, it's it's a challenge to get that balance between what's good for the customer and what's good for the company. And the best thing to do is develop a relationship where you both benefit from the technology and, and the, the UX design strategies that you're employing. Um, Most definitely. Why don't we uh, jump into this last one here? Because this is something you wanted to jump into. I'm super excited about this, actually. Uh, so the question is how to transform or transition, sorry, from digital arts to human factors. And this was posted in the human factors subreddit. Woo, it's not dead. <laughs> it lives. It lives. And this was submitted by Exosox Fo6. Uh, I probably messed that up. I apologize if I did, but that's how I read your name. All right, so they go on to write, I graduated two years ago with a degree in digital arts or 3D animation as I originally planned to work in the film or game industry. I ended up freelancing and then working in tech, producing art, animations, and video for companies designing haptic technology, immersive games, 3D projection mapping, and more. Since being exposed to all sorts of work, I picked up a newfound interest in interaction design and human factors and ergonomics. Thinking about it, I would love to work with my childhood dream, NASA, and or even perhaps work with VR and other immersive technologies. I see why you pulled this one, Blake. The thing is, I'm usually on the art side producing animations rather than directly researching and designing the technology and interactions. I'm currently finishing up my application to an HFE grad program, but it makes me wonder how I'll fare against applicants with backgrounds in engineering and psychology. Any thoughts on how to bridge the gap between digital arts and HFE or how my background is even applicable to HFE at all? Well, there's a lot to digest here. Wow. Uh, Where do you want to start, Blake? That is an intense one. I I want to start by... I don't know, just saying that this is awesome to see it in the human factors subreddit and then somebody from basically an art background that obviously has a talent for doing this because it says that he worked in tech producing art, animation, and videos for haptic design and immersive games. So it sounds like you have some great experience in your own field. Um, I don't know, Nick. I'm always bad at picking a place to start because I think all of this kind of runs together, right? He's got some great experience with haptics and immersive games. Um, and I, I, the way I would go about it is I would weave that into my, you know, my application. Like, here's the things that I've done and the processes I've seen, because obviously he's had to interact with either somebody in design, interaction design, or maybe even HFE, it depends. But I, I, I would, I feel like the past experience they have, plus their obvious passion for creating and researching should land them in a good spot, regardless of, uh, whether they have a psych or an engineering background. Yeah, so, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit on the show before about how to break into the human factors or UX side of things from tangentially related sort of interest areas. And and one way to do it, I always sort of suggest, is to uh, go and read and, and self-teach yourself. And it's all about the way that you spin your experience, right? I... I it's one thing if you've never done a user assessment or, or a user um, test or anything like that to say to, to, to apply to something like a, uh, a human factors researcher or a, a human factors practitioner position. Right. It's another thing to spend what you have done to say 
you know, it's it's in line with what you're doing. So what I'm trying to say here is if you've done sort of these uh, research things in the past, then use that as an opportunity and say, look, I, I understand how things go and uh, maybe look for an entry position. But if you're looking for grad programs, that's great, too. Um, I think you'll be fine with, you know, going up against people who have diverse backgrounds in engineering and psychology and and uh, even kinesiology. I know some people will have that background as well. So there's human factors and ergonomics is 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 for everybody. It's not just for psychology people. It's not just for engineering people. It's kind of a marriage of a lot of different um, interests. And I I don't think you'll have a hard time transitioning at all. Uh, I sure I'm sure in the digital arts you've especially designing um, haptic technology and immersive games. I'm sure you've dealt with actually thinking and putting yourself in the place of the user and saying what would be the best for them here. And uh, once you dig into why, which it sounds like you're already on track to uh, with that mindset. I mean, some people just don't get it. Some people don't know. They just develop an engineering solution and and vomit that out onto the product and leave it up to somebody else to reorganize, right? But it sounds like, to me, that you are already putting the thought and effort into creating something for the user, which is already great. Uh, and when you have that data to back it up, that's that's even better. So I guess to, to kind of ease your worries, I think you'll be okay in a human factors and ergonomics grad program. And uh, I, I, I think you will get that bridged gap in the program itself, and, and you don't really have to worry about it. I'm sure they'll train you on how to do usability tests and whatnot in the program, or you'll learn very quickly uh, from others. So don't worry about it. Uh, hopefully your fears are eased. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say, Blake. You got anything else? Uh, yeah, one thing to not be discouraged by, I really don't think you have anything to worry about as far as how you'll fare. Um, I mean, if, if you have good grades and all that kind of stuff and you, if you, if there is an interview process and you ace that, you should feel good about yourself from it, but I'll share a little story with you. I did not get into grad school the first go around. So one way around this, and especially trying to tie back a little bit to your love for NASA is to either one, like Nick said, apply for internships, which NASA has a lot of different facilities and I constantly still get updates on their internships. So they're always looking for different kinds of people to fill a lot of different roles. Uh, two, if there is a grad programs, sorry, if there's HFE grad program that you like, look into the research that they're doing and say you don't make it in this round, try and volunteer in that lab. Uh, people did that in my, in my grad program. They volunteered either as undergrads or as people who had graduated or interested in human factors. And it was kind of a, a double edged sword here. So they were one uh, volunteering in a grad program, which let them get to know the professors and understand the research methodology, kind of like interact with some of the graduate students, get some mentoring, but also they got to interact with research that they were really interested in. Uh, so that's, that's another route to go. So if, if uh, you don't get in the first time, like just keep, one applying, but also kind of try and get yourself into re some research labs. Or if you happen to have worked with somebody in the past, especially this haptic technology company, I feel like you might have had some experience, hopefully had some experience with either like a UX designer or, or uh, some kind of human factors engineer. Um, if you did try reaching out to them and seeing where they would, uh, where they would have you start or if you're currently in a company try talking to hr about how you can grow from a specific position because that that's something i've never really utilized in a lot of the corporate that's jobs that i've had but it's always something to try and try and do see how you can grow and what opportunities there are for you within the place you are that that's great advice blake i uh i think that's gonna be it for today though so uh you know what if you're brand new to the show welcome we welcome you we thank you for listening and hopefully you found something worthwhile in this. If uh, Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Hate them? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for other news stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media. Let us know there. Or you can join the discussion in our Slack channel. Link, again, is in the show notes. You can head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. 
Be sure to check out our SoundCloud. Leave us a comment over there. We love hearing from you guys. And to do that, you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voicemail if you're feeling saucy at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on Patreon financially at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. If you don't have the money, I completely understand. You can you can do other things to support us, like like and subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory of choice is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for hanging out with me late on a Monday night breaking down all of these human factor stories where can our listeners go if they want to talk about life-saving drones with you if you want to talk about life-saving drones you are more than welcome to hit me up on twitter at don't panic ux but you can also hop in our slack and i'm always in there willing to chat with anybody who hops in or anybody who's already existing yes as for me i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome That's Rome with two O's. (laughs) Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it it depends. depends. Think they're going to have drones for delivering pizza? I hope so.